not advice. <laughs> For sharing with your students. Yeah, let's say like that. <laughs> so the general idea is that people find the answer and they bring it up. People are very open uh, to come close by, ask questions. People will give, be giving like an introductory um, fireside talk uh, about their uh, experience. And then after, you just keep it very informal. So let's give a warm welcome to Gideon. Click on a button here, so then I know the time. Okay. All right, awesome. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Pedro Lopez. I, I lead the Human Computer Integration Lab. That that logo there at the University of Chicago. Um, today is my actual first talk in, in four years. That doesn't start with this slide. So you know that's how I blah 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 human computer integration. But today is much more interesting. It's a, it's about sharing this experience of starting a lab, starting you know being becoming faculty at the University of Chicago and how my journey has been so far. And it's, it's, it's really deeply humbling that, you know, Donald and, and folks invited me to, to do this. Uh, it's, it's really nice to do this annually. Um, when the, when the WIS social chairs invited me for this, the first thing that I thought um, was to, maybe I could convince them to, to call this differently. You know, hang on, you know, it's kind of weird to come here and it's easy to get into a preaching mode where it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, um, but I really don't, don't know much. And because if you read the fine print there, you know, I, I haven't even had tenure. I haven't even done my mid-tenure review, so I don't know much about these things. And and also, because we're all like, list Kai people, n equals one is not a good study, right? Like I've only started one lab, so <laughs> you know, don't trust me on any of the things that I say. And so I was trying to convince them to call it AMA, BRB, YGP, AMA, ANA, ATUI, but I, I think they were not going to go with it. But what this was supposed to stand for was ask me anything, but. Remember, before I generalize this advice, that my assumptions not always applicable to you. I still thought it was going to look good on the website, <laughs> but Donald was like, "Yeah, maybe, maybe it's too long." And <laughs> so, so okay, we we went with the AMA, but you know, I, I want you to sort of imagine that the gray part is still present in your head because you, I don't want you to, to generalize much of this because you really you can't. And I'll, I'll talk about why you can't. Um, as Donald said, we're, we're, I'm going to just talk very quickly about who am I and what I do because I think that is part of the assumptions. Then the bulk part is is, is um, my experience. I'll talk a little bit about I've been collecting questions from people who just started their faculty jobs as well. Like what are the pain points and, and, and I try to organize some of those here. And then we'll switch to the important part, ask me anything. Um, just so you know, we're recording just this first part because some people told me that they couldn't be here, they had to catch a flight, et cetera. But the, we'll close the recording and then on the Q&A part, you know, ask whatever the hell you want. It's not being recorded. Um, so that's it. Um, my experience and who am I? Very, very briefly, I, I started studying at the uh, University of, of uh, Technical University of Lisbon. I studied computer science, both undergrad and master's, and then I went to do a PhD at the Hasselblad Institute, also in computer science. And that was my first WIS, 2012. So it's, I just realized this morning, this is actually 10 years. Um, so that's really nice. And, and, and WIS became a bunch of friends for me. It's, it's a very special thing. And then in 2019, it was like first WIS again uh, because it was the first WIS that my team got to go. And, um, and it was also when I started the lab and started my faculty position at the University of Chicago. Um, what do I do? I run this lab, the Human Computer Integration Lab, which is the same as to say that I work with these people who are really, really wonderful. A lot of them are here if you, if you want to meet them. These are the folks who are here. Um, I think nine of them, including three alumni. Um, so, you know, I, I miss the alumni very dearly every day, but they're here, so it's, it's, you can meet them as well. Now, I want to mention just what do we work on because that is an assumption and that is a bias in this whole talk. My work is highly technical. Um, and so I work on this question. This is what, you know, kind of keeps me up at night and in the waking hours is thinking what comes after mobile and wearable computing and trying to understand the evolution of, of, of computing paradigms and interfaces. And, um, if you don't know my work, then you don't know that what I think about it is that what's happening is that computers are getting more intimately connected to the body to the point that there'll be some biological integration between the two where you can build new kinds of interfaces that don't necessarily just add technology, but actually like use your body as a part of the interface. Um, some of the projects here are some of the things that we've published to try to answer that question or attempt, honestly, to answer that question. And I can kind of summarize it with this slide. This is, this is some of the work I did in my PhD. So our approach is that instead of adding more electronics to externally induced sensations, like maybe you're familiar with how motors can move the human body, we try to do that through uh, actuating the body itself. So for example, in the, in the right side, you see a, a person, myself earlier in my PhD, wearing electrodes 
And, and with that, you can internally induce the exact same sensation, but now the minimum set of components is so much smaller. And, and we've done this in a couple of domains here, um, work on my student jazz trying to create the sensation of temperature through the body, through injecting chemicals rather than you know using a heat lamp, and the work of Jasmine trying to create rich uh, tactile sensation rather than using mechanics, using chemicals as well. Now I'm pointing this out because it's hardware-based research, and you know some of the things I'm going to talk about are maybe not useful for you. So you know discard that. That's one of the assumptions you should be looking out for in that talk. The other part, and this is super important, is that you know I run a mid-sized team and. The size of your team will influence a lot the possibilities that you have, um, both for good and for bad. Um, time, et cetera, money, of course, funding. Um, it's a US-based university, and I don't have experience in other countries. And every single faculty job in every country is so special. And there's so many things you have to keep in mind. So I, I can't even speak for those things. Um, it's also a private university. So even if you are in the US and you wanted to generalize some of the things that I say, I don't know, maybe you're in a universal with different systems. Um, it, I'm also in computer science. and. and and WIS are such interdisciplinary fields or interdisciplinary fields, and we're all in different departments. And so maybe some of the things that I'm saying also do not apply if you're in different departments. And this list is infinite, and I want you to keep that, that stuff in mind. Let's switch to the part two, which I think is really the most important, where I share my experience of simultaneously starting a lab and, of course, starting faculty, which is really what it is. Um, the first thing I collected when I talked to many of you in the last days is that, okay, how do you go about defining one's research agenda and research style. You know, day one, you sit in the office. I'm going to define what my research style is going to look like and my research agenda. And I think what people end up going with, and this is very intuitive and I'm not critiquing it, it does make sense, is, you know, they go how to find out how others maybe, you know, uh, did their agenda, including sitting in talks like this, which I think is a good idea. Um, you observe the peers, maybe you didn't talk to them, but just like, oh, that's how Cedric did it, and how many papers he published, and, you know, you take notes. And, and then you have, of course, the example of your supervisor, the person who you're very intimately connected in your PhD, and you saw it every day how it applies. And then you go from there, and you sort of like extrapolate and implement something very similar. Sometimes su just subconsciously you're going to do that. And I'm just going to try to give a little other option to not fall into this subconscious trap. And this might work very well because you're like, well, that stuff worked really well for Cedric and for everybody else. This must work really well for me. But I think there's a step in between that, that is really important. And I didn't do it immediately, so it was like, ugh, a little trap that I fell into. But it was very important for me, which is to find your own stuff. Take a moment to introspect and just go find what it means for you. And so I'm just going to walk you through what I think are some of the parts of finding that, but it's just an infinite puzzle. Um, and it's not necessarily something that comes automatic. You really have to like make time to sit down and, and think about it. So one of the things, obviously, is to think, why are you doing this? Sometimes it's like a really like, you're on a track, on a tunnel, you finished the PhD, you got this position, you were so lucky and amazing and just like lots of things to do and you don't even have time to say, wait a second, why did I want to really start a lab and start this career? And often the answer, I'm, I'm putting my answer there, there's some kind of grand research question that I'm trying to answer. That is the reason why I'm doing that. So it's not that I wanted to start a lab or that I wanted to, to, to become faculty. And for you, there'll be an answer too, right? It doesn't have to be that one. Uh, it doesn't have to be that diagram or whatever, but but that is the thing that grounds you. And the position and, and all this stuff is just another tool to do research, right, to do that that goal. The other thing that, you know, sometimes you start into these things without thinking too much, and I did that mistake, so I'm talking about my mistake. What are sort of the guiding principles that you want your lab to work with, right? What are the sort of um, things that you believe in, sort of the values of the lab, you know, kindness between people or, you know, is it number of papers? I'm not saying any of these things are right or wrong. I'm just saying you have to find the ones that work for you. Um, and equally well, like what inspires you? Like where are you going to draw inspiration so you can feed that to your students every day or to, to your colleagues and et cetera? Is it from artwork? Is it from high whiz? Whatever it is. Um, similar, and I think this one is really important and it takes a long time. It took, I think I'm still trying to figure this one out. Is what kind of researcher are you? Um, talked to many of you in the last days. I've talked about this sort of hands-on versus hands-off spectrum. And I think there's way more than just the spectrum. There's so many shades and maybe it's three-dimensional or something. But you have to find that before, you know, you even have a lot of people to work with uh, to understand. And the, the only way you can do that is by introspection, really. And also, on that note, what kind of people you work with well? I, I don't work well with everyone in the world. Like, I need some kind of matching of mentalities and principles and, and, and other things, other values, you know. They need to also like the scientific method or whatever the things that I like. 
And so those alignments are important. And it's really just you finding more about yourself. It's just like I learned so much about myself in the process, especially the things that I'm really bad at. Um, which skills do you have? Because those are the things that you can impart in day one. You start your lab, and the skills that you have, you can impart in day one. But maybe they don't answer that grand research question, so what skills do you need? And this is going to be really, really useful for, for finding who is a company in the journey, you know, hiring students and all that. Um, maybe you really want someone that has the things that you don't have and, and can teach you how to do something completely crazy, like I don't know, grow a slime mold or something like that. Um, and then a, a really important part of, of running a lab, and I think, again, remember the bias of the, the size of my lab and everything is, is, is special. It's not too big, but it's not too small. It is an organism itself. So it, there's some kind of cultivation of that organism where there's a, a culture in the lab that is really important. So people are, you know, in, in the case of in my lab, I want them to be kind to each other and I want them to help out each other and, and you know, advance the knowledge and all this stuff. But you need to be there actively thinking what are the values that you want to cultivate in that. And it, it's surprising that you know, if you start and click run on this thing, you haven't thought of some of these things before, and then it's all very ad hoc, and you're like reactive and like didn't have the time for introspection. Um, same thing, and this is a really difficult one to me, is how do you measure progress, right? So you've set up this whole infrastructure, and you've thought very carefully about all these parameters, and then you start running a lab, and like, how, we do, how do we know if we're doing well? Um, and I don't have an answer to this. In, in, in my case, personally, what I tell my students is that I'm looking at how creative we are, not how productive we are. So if we're like super creative, Awesome, like if the ideas are crazier and crazier, that sounds like a really good progression, but if we're just being productive, maybe that's not the, the, the right thing. Um, so finding the style, uh, unfortunately, takes a lot of time. That's the part that I wanna emphasize. And so, but you can see now the power. I'm not saying that stuff was bad. Now you can go back to that list, the stuff that worked for your advisor and for your friends and everything, and now you're like, okay, I don't implement everything. But now I'm very selective and I'm implementing the things that fit my style, that I believe in, that resonate with your heart, whatever it is. Right now you're being selective. And it's fun. Now you might, you might even not do something that worked extremely well for Alexandra or someone else. And it, that sounds crazy. Like if it works perfectly for her, why shouldn't I do it? But you're like, yeah, but it, it, it doesn't fit my you know, heart. And you don't do it. And you'll feel really good about that. At least it's been giving me a lot of joy to be making those decisions in that way. Um, all right. The other thing that I gather from a lot of you when I talked yesterday and the day before, like, okay, how, what was difficult is the transition. Because one day you're a PhD and then the other day they give you this fake diploma thing and, and then they say, like, sit in that office, go. And, and that's a weird transition. Um, I think the part that is the weirdest is how your day looks like. And so I wanted to talk about that because um, I think it's kind of fun. This is, I, I don't know if your PhD day looks like this. And this is also not the scale, is, you know, if you work from, you have family and, and, and caretaking duties, and this is not meant to be like nine to five. It's like whatever to whatever you work on. So this is a, a relative schedule, not absolute schedule. I'm not imposing any kind of thing. But yeah, maybe you do some TAing and, and you do a lot of hands-on research and you maybe you help with classes and you do some service for WIST or whatever it is. But you can see that a lot of time is yours. A lot of time is your own research for your PhD. When you sit in that office for the first day, the, the, the trap that I fell into, and so I wanna share it, is that it starts to be like this, you know, lab meeting, faculty meeting, committee, pe prep, prep teaching, teaching grading, advising student one, two, put out fire, service, grant, and then it just keeps going and there's some more fires somewhere else and office hours and some extra fires over there. And sometimes there's real fires in the lab, like the fire extinguisher <laughs> has been used for the laser cutter, Romain once put something on fire. Um, and I've done a battery on fire too, so, so sometimes it happens. But then, you know, on Friday is the worst day. You realize you did nothing and you're behind on emails and, and you know, letters need to be written and some other stuff. So what I'm about to say is that this fills up really quickly because there's a lot of institutional pressure to do this, right? The universities, even without, you know, I'm not saying they're evil, they will create situations where you have to sort of fit into these molds and there's all these things to do and it's really, really, really hard. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying this won't happen. What I'm trying to tell you that happened to me is that once this happens, where do you even have time to think about what the goal was? So you won't even remember that the goal was not to do research, it's not to do, uh, yeah, that's what you will remember. It was not to start a lab or a faculty. The goal was to do research. And again, in my case, that research question with the bubbles that I've shown you. And you'll just forget it because you had no time to think about it because it's back-to-back -back meetings or whatever happens. So. I didn't want you to generalize the stuff that I'm talking about today, but maybe one thing I will risk 
making a mistake and telling it to generalize, which is try to reverse this idea, try to reverse this trend, and I think the way you do it is by making time for yourself. Okay, so again, asterisk, this one generalizes, go crazy. Um, I think, you know, I, I think there are techniques and there are sort of mechanisms in place that you can use, and maybe when you start you don't realize that they're in place. It took me a few years to realize these mechanisms were there. Uh, you can be super protective of your time, that's a really important one, and you can say no to a lot of things. And your department might actually get your back on that. They might support you in this. They'll say no to like something your chair asked you to do or something, which sounds really crazy. But, but then they're like, yeah, that sounds good because you just started and you're super busy and you don't have any time for, for thinking about things. And you're like, oh, great, I just got out of committee service, <laughs> university service, department service, boom, thinking time. You know, you start building these things up. Uh, maybe you have an opportunity to not teach immediately. Um, this sometimes in the US is called teaching relief and in Europe has different names and different structures. But if you're offered that opportunity, don't be like me, which I made a huge mistake of not using it. I've never done that. And then you just free up a lot of time. You still have to prepare the class eventually, but, but you free up a lot of time, especially at the beginning. The other thing that I learned over the years is to trust my students. And, and that frees up a lot of time too. As you build trust and hands off things to them with courage and be like, Maybe there's a visitor in the lab and there's fires and all of them have the fire safety training, I think. And, and they can also host a visitor and they can put out the fires and a bunch of other things. They do way more than, than I'm highlighting here. And, and also, I learned that you know planning ahead has helped me a lot. And I'm not a very good planner, um, but I've learned that planning ahead helps a lot. You can actually get lots more stuff done and more thinking time ready. And for the PG students in the room that you know wanna try this whole amazing faculty life thing, you can even start today. Like uh, so far, everything I said until now is just thinking exercises. It's a thought experiment. You don't have to have a position to do this exercise. Like, what do I believe in? What are the values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. Um, I will talk about what's different. Even if you're like, I, I don't know if my calendar looks like that anyway. But even if you're really good and you push it and you have a lot of thinking time and etc., there's still some differences. And I, I think a lot of you came talk to me yesterday about this stuff, and it's interesting to talk about. Um, a lot of the time is more fragmented than it used to be, at least when I was a PG student. I had a, a lot of time that I could dedicate to like looking at an EMS circuit and why it doesn't it work. Um, and, and, and now I don't have that. There's a lot of context switching. It's still very fast. Um, and, and I want to say something about context switching. It, it, I think especially if your body doesn't like that, right? Like there's so, so many ways that maybe you're not comfortable switching every 30 minutes for meetings or something, then be extra protective. You know, protect from burnout and from, you know, doing too much of this stuff. So really, again, being protective of your time. Um, the faculty schedule tends to demand more flexibility. Sometimes people say it's more flexible. True, but it demands flexibility because now I'm at WISP, for example, and everything is behind. You know, like, <laughs> I'm a week in the past right now. And, and there's sometimes the faculty retreat and the paper deadline and the IRB deadline and the invoices, which I always almost get fired every three months because I don't file the invoices on time. And all those things uh, just demand a hyper flexibility. And that's tough, again, because if you have family to take care of or other things that you want to do, hyper flexibility means, well, you have to now put extra hours. So by having more protective time in cases of demand, high demand flexibility, that's what you're going to use probably. Um, the other thing that is different from PhD life to you know what I do now and, and what a lot of you do now is just that a lot of the time is spent on caring for people. And I meant it in like a career way like caring for the career of my students rather than even thinking about my own stuff. Sometimes I, I don't even get to think so much about that. Again, making time might help, but you'll see how you know, you'll know you kind of flip to that other priority. And that I think that's fine, but something to keep in mind that is a difference. And, and the other part, which is both a, a upshot and a downside, is the schedule evolves really fast. This maybe looks like this in the first year. Then there's no more teaching relief, if that was your case, and maybe you're teaching more or less, or it, things committees that you can say no event for forever. And so it will evolve. Now the good part is that you also evolve with it. So some things that feel felt really difficult in day one would feel like a no brainer in you know year four or something like that. So it doesn't is as scary the evolution of that that time in here. Now the other thing that I realized is that nobody asked me what was the same, you know, and so I wanted to talk about the good stuff because I feel like there's a lot of negative discourse about academia. And, and not a lot of good discourse. And I wanted to bring some of the things. Um, it makes it makes a lot of the discourse makes faculty life sound really harsh and undesirable, and it's not true. Um, it's literally the most, most fun I ever had in my life, and I think the most fun you will ever have. 
Um, here's my mathematical formula. Faculty fund equals PhD fund to the power of three. Right? This is like orders of magnitude on top of the PhD. It's so much fun. It's insanely fun. Um, you're always learning. So you're like, oh, and then I'm never going to learn anything anymore. Uh, Romain teaches me circuits every day, and Jasmine teaches me biology, and Jack teaches me chemistry, and Alex teaches me physics. Um, you guys teach me neuroscience. I, I'm forgetting who else teaches me stuff. But every day, you're going to be studying something with someone or by yourself, and I have to keep up with them. So I have to like go and be like, what's a Pycerum and what's an organism? Um, so that's really beautiful. And then you, you still do, do research every day. Truthfully, it does look a little bit different. Uh, only 5% of the time I can like sit with you die and we're having fun making these demos for like Detectile. Only 5%. And the 95 is, 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 is doing that. But there's less hands-on in my case and, and more you sort of meta thinking and et cetera. But that's still part of research and it's a super fun part of research. It just looks different. And, and then I think you still get to be around inspiring people every day. And I think that's the, the coolest thing ever for a job. I mean, I actually think people don't tell you this. In your PhD, you are also around amazing people, your colleagues, uh, your PhD colleagues. But this is even cooler because my colleagues, my faculty colleagues, are also insanely inspiring and ten times more creative than me. So I'm like around my students plus all the faculty, just like really an in engaging environment. Um, all right, very quickly, I'm almost done. You start the lab, and I think that's where those insights of the introspection come into play. They help you start the lab. You're running the lab, that's where knowing where the inspiration comes from and the guiding process, what are the values, is it kindness, is it fairness, all these things are super, super important. And then you're cultivating it because really the, you don't run the lab, like you nudge it in directions occasionally and maybe you prune a little bit of the tree or something, but you're not there like stop everything and let's do something else, all right? Um, I, the, the best metaphor I can come up with, this is a photo of, of day one. Um, is like a lab is like a seed and, and what happens is you plant the seed and it starts growing very slowly, but you need to take care of it. This is when Shani learns the thing first time and, and eventually it grows. And it, it's kind of an organic thing. Again, you can nudge it, but it's growing by itself and eventually you have a nice laser cut room. Um, so the last thing that people ask me a little bit to talk about too and then we switch to AMA is what happens when it grows back. Fires and other stuff. Uh, who are you going to ask for help? Because in the PhD, it felt naturally there was someone to ask for help, your advisor or second advisor or something like that, your colleagues. How does it work in the faculty world? It's the same. It's just that you have maybe to be a little bit more proactive in finding the mentors and going knock at the door and being like, can you help me? Uh, here are the people that really help me every day basis, and I just want to tell you what they do and what I ask them so you understand what the, what the abilities of, of mentors are. Uh, Heather Zhang and Ben Zhao are amazing people, and I ask them everything about advising grants and career. Uh, Anne is my, and Roger is also University of Chicago, is my teaching guru. I ask her lots of difficult questions about teaching. Um, Mike Franklin, department chair, I ask him things about career advancement and how does it work at the university, like really things that I don't know who else knows the answer except Mike and helping him with things. Um, Nidia Yak is the person who prevents me from being fired with all those invoices and other stuff and just has saved all my students lives millions of times, I've had to ask her more questions than I have asked anybody else. She's really amazing. And of course, everybody there is from your own university. You need to have someone external as well to ask a few weird questions. Oh, and this is a University of Chicago unrelated question or secret question. What, who can you ask? You can always ask your advisor, right? Um, I ask lots of life and career questions to Patrick and sometimes I get some good YouTube links from him too that have been fun and useful. Um, so what I'm trying to emphasize here is that you gotta go ask for help. The cool thing, is that now it's n equals six because all these people have started a lab. So starting to be like, not like a Kyrie Jack, you know, your R and R or something like that. So we get a better sample. So you have these people, and they've all started a lab. They've all been in your shoes. They all have tons of advice. You just go ask them. It sounds really scary at the beginning. I didn't ask anything for a whole year, I think, and now I just I just ask. Um, yeah, one takeaway message before we switch to the AMA. Again, it's just re-emphasizing it that the goal was not to become faculty. The goal was not to have a lab. These are just tools to help you do the research. Um, and so whenever you feel overwhelmed, it, which you will, and I do every day, you recall that goal and all of a sudden it's fine. And all of a sudden you start remembering those techniques and all those, yeah, the little things that I thought about, what are the values, what are the things that my heart is guided by, and you're like, okay, I gotta make time for that stuff because I'm overwhelmed. Um, so that's what works. But remember, also ignore all my advice. <laughs> um, seek out multiple perspectives. There's so many amazing people. Um, I just listed from memory people until the slide ran out of space that just started in the last years. 
Uh, many of them are here. I'm pointing at Alex right now. Um, so go ask them. Their perspective might be very different from mine. And um, here are all the things I didn't talk about. Here are the people I took knowledge, my mentors, and, and my team, especially Jazz, who sat with me and said, here's what a PhD student also is curious about knowing from, from this perspective. So thank you, Jazz, for uh, guiding me on that. And that's it. I'll sit there, and you can ask me questions for the remaining of the time. Yes, I have to take the microphone.